Understanding the role and capabilities of fighters and Axis and allies is a critical part to any path to victory. In this video, we're going to break them down so that you'll be ready to dominate the skies in your next game. Let's make it hot. Welcome to Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching. Today we're talking about air combat and Axis and Allies. This is part one of a three-part series. In part two, we'll be covering bombers and strategic bombing raids. Part three, anti-aircraft artillery. In this video, we're going to cover the basic stats for fighters, the rules for how they enter and exit combat, and how you can use a carrier to give you more options and to speed up their mobilization. One quick thing. If you're brand new to Axis and Allies, this video may not be for you. This video is going to assume that you're comfortable with the basic mechanics of combat for Axis and Allies and, well, access knowledge in general. If that's not you, you need to head over to our complete how to play video linked in the card above. It'll take you through the game from the very top or you can jump around using the chapter guide in the description. This video series is for folks looking for rules clarifications and examples specifically about air combat. Overall, we'll be focusing on 1942 second edition, but thankfully the rules for air combat haven't changed that much since the original came out back in 1984. So about 88.6% of this series is going to transfer to other versions of the game. Before we get started, if you enjoy content like this, please take a second and subscribe to the channel. Thanks. All right, here we go. The battle for air superiority was a critical part of World War II. Naturally, it plays a big role here. Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition features two types of air units, the fighter and the bomber. Today we're looking at the fighter. Let's look at those basic stats. The fighter has a total movement of 4, attacks at a 3, and defends at a 4, with a total cost of 10 IPCs. Their special ability, fighters can land on aircraft carriers. Obviously, air units have much greater movement capability than land units, but unlike land units, they can't take control of a territory, and they have to land in a territory that was friendly at the beginning of their turn or on a friendly carrier. Another way to say this, 99% of the time, air units will have to split their movement between combat and non-combat movement. They've got to use movement to get to a fight, and they've got to use movement to find a friendly place to touch down. Before we get into examples of fighter combat movement, it's important to remember this. This game has no kamikaze attacks. If you launch an air unit, it must have at least a theoretical place to land. More on this later. Let's go to the board. It's time for the combat move of the UK, and they've got a fighter in India. It's got a maximum movement of four spaces. When counting movement for any air unit, here's the easiest way to think about it. Anytime a unit crosses a line, that counts as one move. So crossing a line from one land territory to another, or from one land territory to a sea zone, is all the same. Cross a line, use a move. So let's look at the options for this fighter. Of course, the first option is to do nothing and stay home. The fighter isn't required to enter combat, but that's just boring. Option number two, it could move out and attack the infantry in Malaya. This would use three of its moves, leaving it one more to find a place to land. Can we find a theoretical place for this fighter to land? It can't land in the Japanese-controlled French Indochina Thailand, but if the fighter survives the combat, the UK can move the carrier from 48 into 36. The fighter now has a theoretical place to land. Option number three. The fighter can attack the guy in Quang Tung. Again, it uses three moves to get there, and it has one move left. It can land in any of the American-controlled territories, or, with the permission of the American player, the fighter can land on the American carrier already in C-Zone 61. Or, we could use that UK carrier again. It can move from 48 into 61 and catch that fighter. Real quick, if you're playing Axis and Allies online by Beamdog through Steam, you're not allowed to land fighters on friendly carriers. I'm not sure why. Maybe this will change later, but when we shot this, it wasn't a thing. Something to notice here. The British fighter can't attack the infantry in Borneo. That would use all four moves, and regardless of how that battle goes, it can't land in a territory that was hostile at the beginning of the turn. But, the fighter can attack the cruiser in C-Zone 49. While this does use all four moves to get there, the carrier in 48 can move into 49 and catch it during non-combat. There was some debate about that last part because the fighter landing is dependent on the battle. Now I'm 117% certain that we're correct about this, but I understand how it could be confusing. So I've written a small explanation that's in the pinned comment below. The other thing to notice about these land battles is that the air unit is attacking alone. That means that even if the attack is successful, the UK won't be able to take control of the territory. They would need a land unit to do that. So regardless of the outcome, these will stay under the control of the Japanese. Makes sense? This is actually pretty straightforward, but people have a tendency to overthink it. Okay, let's look at an example of how fighters use their special ability to take off and land on carriers. Let's start with something that you're not allowed to do. Each carrier creates a place for up to two fighters to take off and land. The fighters move independent from the carrier, so you're not allowed to do this. You can't move the carrier, then launch the fighters. The fighters take off from the place that they started the turn. In this case, C-Zone 50. Remember, 
This game has no kamikaze attacks, so every air unit that takes off must have at least a theoretical place to land. However, they don't have to come back to the carrier they started with, or to a carrier at all. The process of setting up the routes that planes are planning to take to get to combat and land safely is called pathing. You aren't bound to that path, but you have to show that there was at least a possibility that your air unit could land safely. Something to notice here. Players can land fighters on friendly carriers, provided that the space is available on the carrier and that other player agrees. If a carrier is hosting a friendly fighter and it comes under attack, the friendly fighter defends with the rest of the units defending the sea zone. But remember, units can only attack on that player's turn. So if the player that owns the carrier moves the carrier into battle, the friendly fighter is just cargo, much like transports, and is not part of the attack. If that carrier is destroyed during the attack, the fighter is also destroyed. Unlike moving from a land territory to a sea zone, launching from a carrier doesn't spend one of the fighter's movements. So here you can see that the fighter takes off from the carrier in 60, uses three moves, and plans to do combat in 65. They'll have one move remaining to find a place to land. The Japanese want to attack Sea Zone 65 and 57 with everything that can reach. Let's see what we can do. One of these fighters will take a shot at the destroyer and transport up here. The fighter may not survive, but it will still need a place to land. The carrier in 60 could move to 64 and provide a landing space for that fighter. It doesn't move now, but everyone can see that there is at least a theoretical place for that fighter to land. Next, Japan wants to attack the American carrier in 57. It has an American and a British fighter on board, and both fighters will defend when it's attacked. What can Japan get to 57? The cruiser from 50, a fighter from 50 can get there with two moves left. The fighter on the carrier in 60 can get there and it'll have two moves left. The fighter from Japan can get there with one move left. Both carriers could enter combat as well, but this is usually not a good idea because they only attack at a one. So if all the air units survived, do we have a place for all fighters entering combat in 57 to land? The fighters with two moves left can land in Iwo Jima or Wake Island, and the fighter with one move left can land on the carrier that was planning to move to 64. Now everyone has at least a theoretical place to land safely. For this example, let's just assume that in 57 the Japanese destroyed the carrier and both fighters and lost all but one fighter. And let's say that the fighter sank the destroyer in 65 and then killed the undefended transport. Now we've got two fighters that need a place to land. A few options. Sea Zone 57 is now friendly, so the carrier in 60 can move out there and have both fighters land on it. That carrier could also move to 64 and grab them. The carrier in 50 could get involved. As you can see, there's a lot of ways to go. I know there was a lot going on in that example, but hopefully it shows you the flexibility that carriers can give you. One last note about carrier and fighter movement. Earlier I said that you weren't bound to the theoretical path that you laid out for your fighters, and that's true. However, no matter what happens in combat, you must make every possible effort to provide a safe place for every fighter that you've launched even if that puts you in a bad position at the end of the non-combat phase. You cannot willingly let fighters crash. If you can save them, you must. In the rare instance that you're facing losing more than one fighter because of a failed combat, you, as the attacker, get to choose which fighter to save. Carriers with fighters are very powerful on the defense, but they always need to be on the lookout for submarines. Remember, without help, air units can't hit subs. So what happens if a carrier is destroyed with a fighter on board? It's time for the German combat move, and they want to sink the ships in Sea Zone 12. They put a marker down and move the subs. The subs off the coast of DC have no problem, and the subs in Sea Zone 7 and 8 can move under the cruiser in Sea Zone 9 to get to the fight. So that gives us four subs versus a destroyer, an aircraft carrier, and one fighter. Let's do some combat. We've got the pieces on the board. Now we have a destroyer present, so no sneak attack. The subs will have to attack in step three. Let's roll. The subs will hit on a two. One hit. Remember, the subs can't hit the fighter, so the Americans have to take the hit on a ship. They choose the destroyer. Because the Americans had a destroyer present at the beginning of the round of combat, the fighter will also get a chance to shoot back at the subs. So we have a destroyer and an aircraft carrier defending at a two. One hit. And a fighter at a four. Another hit. The Germans lose two subs. The destroyer heads back to the box. Press the attack or retreat. Notice that the destroyer is no longer present, so the subs get their super cool abilities back for this round. The Germans continue the fight. Both subs will get to fire in step two this time and get a hit. The Americans cannot take the hit on the plane, so it sinks the aircraft carrier. And because of the surprise attack and can't be hit by plane's ability, the subs get to float away in style without worrying about anyone being able to return fire. As an added bonus, if a fighter loses its carrier during combat, it only gets one move to try to find safety. 
There aren't any friendly carriers or land nearby, so the fighter crashes into the ocean and is destroyed as well. And all that's great, but my favorite thing about carriers is how they mobilize. All land units and bombers must be placed in eligible factories in land territories. However, if you purchase a carrier at the beginning of your turn, and you end a fighter's non-combat movement where that carrier is going to be built, the result will be that at the end of that turn, that sea zone now has a carrier and a fighter in it. Also, the reverse is true. If you're going to end a turn with a carrier in a sea zone adjacent to a territory you're planning to build a fighter, it can start on the carrier. Let's quickly look at the east coast of the United States and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The Americans purchased two fighters at the beginning of their turn, which is good news for the lonely carrier in sea zone 13. If that carrier ends its turn in sea zone 11, those shiny new fighters will spawn on the carrier. Now the reverse. The Americans purchased a new carrier at the start of their turn, so if the fighters end the non-combat phase in C Zone 11, the new carrier can pick them up and have some new friends. Lastly, the Americans can purchase a carrier and one or two fighters. When they're built, they can spawn together in C Zone 11. The Americans could also mix it up. If they bought a carrier and one fighter, they could be joined by a second fighter that came in from elsewhere. Placing a fighter on an incoming carrier is optional. You can also build the fighter on land if you want to, but mobilizing with the carrier speeds up the mobilization of fighters in a way that can make a big difference in the game. Next time we'll help you bomb your enemies back to the Stone Age. In part two, we're gonna cover bombers and their special ability, strategic bombing raids. When that video is ready, it'll be right here. If you wanna take a look at our series on sea combat, click here. And if you want the entire how to play for Axis and Allies, here's your link. And if you're ready to join Board Game Nation, click here to subscribe. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.